I'm going to give try and give a Catholic cut on the issues you're dealing with. And I want to emphasize it's a Catholic cut. There are obviously the great variety. Some people have been a part of our community, are a part of our community. I'm going to try and uh, uh, cover the mission quickly, the message, Catholic social thought, a little bit about context, and then some liabilities and assets that the Catholic community brings to poverty and public life. Talk a little bit about Pope Francis, and then, if time permits, some directions and dangers. Uh, this is 65 years of Catholic participation in public life. Uh, you're all too young to know this, but John Kennedy ran for president. Billy Graham, uh, Norman Vincent Peale, Dr. Martin Luther King Sr. were part of a committee and many others who said a Catholic uh, should not be president because he would take orders from the Pope. It was a serious challenge. And Kennedy took it on. And this is him giving a speech to the Houston Ministerial Conference where he said he was an American candidate for president who happened to be Catholic. The picture next to him five years ago is Pope Francis. And behind him are two Catholics, John Boehner, Speaker of the House, uh, who was so excited about this. He left the Congress after uh, the Pope spoke. It might have had something to do with the Tea Party and the rest of it. But the other man you'll recognize, Joe Biden, these were two young uh, kids from Pennsylvania and Ohio who grew up at a time when uh, they knew about no Catholic should be president. They knew about uh, the, you can't trust them because they'll take advice from the Pope. And the only two things their parties agreed on five years ago was they needed advice from this Pope. I had the honor of being in the hall uh, to listen to him and I couldn't help. Obviously I was fixed on the Pope, but thinking of those two Catholic guys behind him, two different parties, two different histories, but what those 65 years uh, represented. Uh, when it comes to mission, this is something you've talked about as part of all your studies. Uh, what brings us together, what brings people to this class, to the schools of theology, is not politics, it's not ideology, it's uh, conviction, it's faith. Uh, and so when you think about Catholic social thought, we're not talking about the Democratic Party at prayer, you're not talking about the uh, religious caucus of the Republican Party, you're talking about a community of faith. And you've all worked on a mission statement. The best, I, I work with David, David was a great planner, a great strategist. He always wanted us clear on mission. I hated all that stuff. I wanted to know how we were going to win. I was chair of his board and uh, we drove each other crazy because he was strategic and thoughtful. And I was, what are we going to do? But the best mission statement I ever read is not something David wrote. I, I'm sorry, David. It's the story you know well, it's Jesus in his hometown synagogue in Nazareth, reading the words of Isaiah. I've come to bring good news to the poor, liberty to captives, new sight to the blind, to set the downtrodden free. And we could spend the whole afternoon on Good Friday talking about the price Jesus paid for that. And my book conviction, that was not only Jesus' mission on earth, that's our mission today uh, as Christians. That's only one example. You could do the Beatitudes, uh, the story of the Last Judgment, the Hebrew prophets. Uh, this tradition is anchored in the Word of God. It, uh, and the Catholic community has been trying to share that those values for 2,000 years and especially over uh, the last uh, 130 years and the in what we call Catholic social teaching. And we could spend the rest of the afternoon talking about 
a whole series of papal encyclicals. 1891, Rerum Novarum of New Things was about the church's response to the industrial re revolution and put the church on the side of the poor. Pachum and Terrace by John the 23rd about human rights and the cause of peace. Uh, John Paul II on solidarity and the rights of workers. Uh, Pope Francis has done two encyclicals, uh, Fratelli Tutti just six months ago, and uh, Laudato Si. Laudato Si, the first encyclical on care for creation, although John Paul II and Benedict were leaders in that regard. And then this most recent one on how the whole family is knit together. And Jim Martin said it best. He said, uh, Laudato Si said, everything is connected. The earth, creation, uh, human beings, all of it is connected. And Fratelli Tutti uh, said, everyone is connected, that we in fact belong to each other. All this has led to an effort to try and share some ideas, a principal asset of Catholic teaching called Catholic social teaching. They offer uh, criteria for judgment, directions for action, uh, values for reflection, and they don't fit the categories of right and left. Uh, my own experience is uh, the people outside the Catholic community are in many ways more interested in Catholic social teaching than people inside. And the, the way I try and describe this is to remember that the most important word in Catholic social teaching is the word and, A-N-D, because it tries to put together things that normally don't belong together. So uh, the first principle is the life and dignity of the human person. Uh, in my experience on Capitol Hill, you got a bunch that talk a lot about life, some who talk about dignity. This tradition tries to put that together. Dignity is not something we earn by our good behavior, it's a gift of God. Number two, human rights and responsibilities. David knows this well, when it comes to poverty, got lots of people who talk about rights, lots of people who talk about responsibility, very few people who talk about both. Uh, the human person is not only sacred, but social. So family, community, participation. This is the notion of the common good, that we belong to each other. It, it underlies what David described, the Catholic Campaign for Human Development, where the church every year at Thanksgiving takes up a collection, about $10 million, that goes to grassroots community organizations and economic development. So half a billion dollars over the last 50 years. The Catholic Church is the largest uh, supporter of community organizing in the country. Uh, I've only had a chance to met, meet uh, President Obama a couple of times. He came to Georgetown to be a part of a panel on poverty, David was there. And I always remind him that his first job was working for a community organization funded by the Catholic Church. So uh, the rights of workers, the dignity of work where it all began, the struggle over the minimum wage, the priority for the poor and the vulnerable. Uh, David's probably told you the story where uh, in the middle of enormous pressure to cut the budget, uh, a group David led and I helped, I was a part of too, called the Circle of Protection. We got a meeting with the President of the United States and I got a bishop from Las Cruces, New Mexico to come. Great guy, Ricardo Ramirez. And we held hands and prayed. Uh, I'd never done that in the Roosevelt Room. And our bishop looked over at President Obama and he said, I know you're a Christian. I know you chose Christ at an adult age, but I, I'm confused. He said, in my Bible, it says, whatsoever you do for the least of these, you do unto me, you do unto Christ. And he says, Washington must have a different Bible. 
because you forget about the least of these and worry about the most of these, the quote, forgotten middle class. And the president said, I think you've got us on that one. And as a result of that meeting and another meeting with uh, Paul Ryan, you should ask David about that or me later, uh, the, the, an agreement was reached in the middle of the night that uh, uh, the sequester, the automatic budget cuts, would exclude the lifelines for poor families and kids, food stamps, Medicaid, the tax credits. That's the priority for the poor in action. Uh, solidarity and subsidiarity. Solidarity, we belong to each other. Subsidiarity is how we divide up the work. I think the pandemic has been a story of the, the urgency of sol solidarity and the failure of subsidiarity. The federal government dropped the ball and the states struggled and we've all struggled. Uh, the uh, finally uh, care for creation, which is a new theme in Catholic social teaching, uh, articulated most powerfully by John Paul II and Benedict, but for the first time, Pope Francis uh, uh, really lifted up in a formal way. And what I love about what Pope Francis did is the Catholic end again. He put care for creation at the center of Christian life. And he put care for the least of these at the center of an environmental ethic. He said there are two crises, an ecological crisis and a human crisis, and Christians have to respond to both. So that tradition expressed in those values give us an asset. The, uh, we carry out that mission and that message in a context that you've probably been talking about all semester, both in class and out. The pandemic, which as Pope Francis has said, has revealed who we are, our best and our worst. The, the economy which uh, divides us instead of bringing us together. The gaps have only grown worse. Uh, we're a nation in crisis facing uh, racial reckoning. I grew up a mile from where George Floyd was murdered. Uh, so we lived in the same community, but we had very different lives. And uh, the major reason for that is I'm white and he's black. Uh, David has spent his life trying to bring uh, comfort and food and justice to a suffering world. Uh, there are two things I would lift up quickly. One is what I would call polarized politics. Originally, that's what we were gonna talk about and how to overcome that. I don't know how to overcome that these days. It is so overwhelming. I come from a mixed marriage. My mother's family was Republican, my dad's Democratic. I always thought we could find ways to work together. Not one Republican voted for the Recovery Act. Uh, and we can't even agree on who won the election. I mean, those are fighting words this, is, this Easter around families. And that polarization, sadly, is carried forward in the church, including in the Catholic church. Uh, our church is divided in lots of ways. It's wounded in lots of ways. The... Uh, uh, the, the question for a lot of us is, does your faith shape your uh, politics or is it the other way around? And what has happened is that uh, ideology and partisan politics has destroyed, or is undermining the unity of the church. We have lots of other problems and I'll begin with our liabilities. One is the, uh, those divisions. We can't even agree on the Pope. The best indication of how people feel about Pope Francis is not how often they go to church, how serious they are about their faith. It's whether they're a Democrat or a Republican. Uh, we have all sorts of institutional dysfunctions. We're run by men, older, celibate, 
men. Uh, I worked for bishops all my life. I respect a lot of them. Uh, they don't have all the answers in an institution that depends only on older uh, celibate men, probably uh, is ignoring a lot of what uh, needs to be known in order to make choices. We have a leadership crisis. I very much admire, I in fact love Pope Francis. If you haven't seen it, Discovery has a terrific film called Francisco uh, that was just uh, streamed, I think in the last couple of days. And it reminded me why I loved him. But beyond the Holy Father at the Vatican, in lots of dioceses, and sadly in a lot of Catholic parishes, we don't have the kind of leadership we need to carry forward that mission and that message. And we have been wounded in a particularly horrible way by the clergy sex abuse crisis. 7,000 priests. Uh, for me, David knows his story. This is personal, this is professional, this is institutional. I had not talked about this, uh, but after the Pennsylvania grand jury report, after Cardinal McCarrick, who was a dear friend and lied to me straight out about his own behavior, I acknowledged for the first time that I was a survivor of clergy sex abuse in a high school seminary in Minnesota. So there's questions of accountability. Frankly, it's questions of power. Uh, and we can talk more about that. Uh, but and clericalism is uh, something which haunts our church. So we're pretty clear, I'm pretty clear about some of our liabilities, but I would like to suggest that we have some assets as well. And a principal asset is this tradition of Catholic social thought, which gives us a different way of looking at the world. Uh, we also, we're an institutional, church, hierarchical church on some days. And that means that we have capacity. It means we have presence. Uh, the Catholic church is big, it's diverse, it's divided, but it's also everywhere. It's in the poorest places on earth and the centers of power. It's in rural communities, urban communities, suburban communities. Uh, lots of white people, lots of old white people like me. Uh, the vitality of the church is young and Latino. And the probably most underappreciated part of the community of faith in the Catholic community is African-American Catholics, of which there are 3 million. If you were to list the most vibrant parishes in my home in Washington, DC, five of them would be black churches. Uh, and yet we have the first African-American Archbishop of Washington just two years ago. But the fact that we have presence, we have institutions. So uh, when, when David and I would go on the Hill talking to Paul Ryan or others, part of what I brought was not just these ideas, the priority for the poor or human dignity, is the fact that we're the largest provider of healthcare outside the government. We take care of the sick. We shelter the homeless. We feed the hungry, as does the whole Christian community and lots of wonderful people. But we are structured in a way that we educate the young, we care for the sick, uh, we feed the hungry. And that gives us insight and frankly, credibility. My experience on Capitol Hill is they mostly listen to us because of what we did in, more than what we said or believed. And that experience really matters. Catholic Relief Services is in a hundred countries, the poorest places on earth, helping people live with some dignity and feed their families. The other assets we have, we're big. There's 75 million of us. Uh, the second largest uh, denomination, if you wanna count it that way in the United States, is former Catholics. Uh, that's not something to brag about, but it tells you how big this community is. As I said, we're diverse. Only the studies say, the sociologists, some of you probably are in the social sciences, say 
before the pandemic, only a third of us went to church on a weekly basis. That's down substantially. But a third of 75 million is 25 million. 25 million people get together once a week to try and figure out how they can be better people. What would NBC News give for that? What would, you know, uh, moveon.org, what would, uh, you know, uh, some of these right-wing groups that are all over us. Uh, so we have ideas, we have uh, presence, we have institutions, we have people. An organizer friend of mine said, if, if you ever got your act together, you'd be dangerous. Well, we don't have our act together, but I do think we have people and we have leaders. Just as the Christian community has leaders like David, we have leaders, some of whom we call saints. Think about Dorothy Day or Mother Teresa. But I think in particular, uh, we have a leader right now in Pope Francis. And let's be clear, Pope Francis is an old Italian immigrant who grew up in Argentina. He has his own biases, his own limitations in lots of ways but I think he gets a lot of things right. The, uh, it's a sin to uh, tell anyone what happened in the papal conclave. And so what did Pope Francis do after he was elected to call a press conference and say what happened in the papal conclave? And he said when the vote, when it was getting dangerous, these are his words, when the votes were adding up, his friend, Cardinal Humes from Brazil, leaned over, gave him a hug, gave him a kiss, the Pope said, and said, don't forget about the poor. And Francis said, that's when I decided I'll call myself Francis. He's a man of poor, man of peace, a man of creation. A lot of people uh, in the Catholic community say they don't really understand uh, Pope Francis. What they really mean is they don't like his leadership or his priorities. I don't think it's very complicated. He told us on the first day uh, what he was going to do. A man of peace, man of the poor, man of creation. And he has tried to follow through. Uh, I think I had a conversation with uh, Vice President Biden uh, and uh, I, everybody in Washington talks about how close they are to uh, President Biden. I am not close, but I my first campaign contribution was to a young man in Delaware, Joe Biden. At one point, he tore my face off because he thought he was getting attacked on abortion when he was doing a lot on civil rights and environment, and he thought I was somehow responsible for that. And then he asked to meet with me when Pope Francis was coming and I had a chance to talk to him and uh, he wanted to know, how do you talk about this stuff, abortion, the Pope, all that. And I said, uh, Mr. Vice President, please don't take this the wrong way. Do not practice theology without a license. You should never say the word Aquinas or Augustine. Talk about who you are, where you come from, what you believe. And then I said, how come you don't talk about the poor very much? And he said, because it's a political loser. He says, I talk about the middle class, and then we bring everybody along. And he said, you and Teddy, Teddy Kennedy, talk about that. That's a political loser. And I said to him, you love Pope Francis, and all he does is talk about the poor. And his ratings are double yours. So why don't you try it? And I don't think that made much of a difference, but I think the most remarkable thing about President Biden's leadership is how he is investing in ways people like David and I, who have worked on this for decades, could not imagine. And we're gonna have to fight to keep it there. But Pope Francis looks at the world from the bottom up, from the outside in. And he thinks the church ought to be a field hospital, not an institution on the hill. Symbols are really important. 
in, in a sacramental church. So what kind of car he rides on, the fact that he, the first thing he did was wash the feet of prisoners and women and Muslims. Uh, he went, there's a great story that when he had just been elected Pope, there was a terrible accident off the coast of Italy where a boat had sunk and migrants had lost their lives. They were trying to get to Lampedusa is the place. And the Pope says, uh, we ought to go to Lampedusa. And the, his new bureaucratic friends said, well, yes, next year or the year after. And he said, no, we ought to go next week. And they pushed him away, pushed him away. And then uh, I've heard this story from someone who knows. Uh, Alitalia Airlines called the Secretary of State at the Vatican and said, you ought to know that a person named Jorge Bergoglio has purchased two tickets to Lampedusa next week. So this is not a guy who has a lot of patience. The scene for me that symbolizes the pandemic was him alone in St. Peter's Square saying it reveals who we are and who we are not. I'm going on too long about Pope Francis. Let me pull this together. Uh, one more thing about Pope Francis. I was really worried when he came to the United States that he would lecture us. This is, we think we're the center of the world. He had never been to the United States. And who can imagine that a Pope would come to Washington through Havana? Uh, this is not the way we think about things. He showed enormous respect for us. I asked you to read this speech. He talked about a nation can be considered great when it defends liberty as Lincoln did, when it fosters full rights for all as Dr. King did, when it strives for justice and the oppressed as Dorothy Day did, and it sows peace as Thomas Burton. So he knows our history and, uh, and challenged us to live up to it. The most important thing that I learned from Pope Francis when he was in Washington was not what he said, but what he did. After the speech, this momentous experience, he went out, he said hello to the crowd. And then instead of having lunch with the movers and shakers, the most powerful people in the most powerful country, he went and ate lunch with the hungry and the homeless to Washington and set an example. That tradition, that leadership should push us to be in a really good place right now. We are not in a good place. We are divided. The US bishops and Pope Francis view their, their mission, their ministry, their message very differently. There are two kinds of leadership. One is if you think we've lost the culture war, you sort of hunker down and try and preserve and protect you judge and you condemn. And some of the US bishops are, are there. If you think we have what the world needs, you engage and persuade. And Pope Francis is an engage and persuade kind of leader. The divisions within politics, as I said, are now being felt in the Catholic community. There's this, in my mind, this terrible idea that uh, the president of the United States, who is a Catholic, goes to mass more than most Catholics, ought to be denied communion because of his position on abortion. I am pro-life. I think a million abortions a year is an indictment of our nation. We can, I'm sure there are people with very different views. But the idea that we would use the Eucharist as a weapon rather than engage and persuade. And a study, just a poll came out this week most American Catholics think that's a terrible idea, and I agree with them. A majority of Republican Catholics think the President of the United States ought to be denied communion. If you were to summarize a Catholic traditional approach to overcoming poverty, it, the symbol would be a table, and part of it a table because the Eucharist, part of it because it's the family, uh, and that table has four legs. One leg is what individuals and families ought to do. 
in terms of sacrifice for their kids, get an education, uh, wait to have kids until they, they're married and can take care of those kids. A second leg of that table would be what the faith community, what community organizations and uh, unions and groups like that should be doing uh, to help families make those choices to overcome injustice. A third leg of that table would be the market. Decent jobs and decent wages with healthcare where you can make a difference. Uh, and then the fourth leg of that table would be the role of government and uh, trying to lift up families, trying to combat injustice, trying to make sure everybody has decent work and decent wages. And as the president's trying to do, trying to provide a floor for kids in poverty. The Catholic way is trying to bring those things together when we're at our best. When we're at our worst, we focus on one leg of the table. Washington, in my experience, is in, lo in love with one leg of the table. What families ought to do, what faith-based groups ought to do, what the market ought to do, or what government ought to do, when in fact we need those institutions to work together. So with that, I hope I've given you some sense of the diversity, the liabilities, the foundations, the assets, and the leadership of the Catholic community and how we can and might uh, make a difference in the cause we care about, which is overcoming poverty. <laughs>